Hello and welcome to The Wine Down with Lathwaite's part of the Henley Literary Festival and I'm joined today by historian and author Ian McGregor. Hello Ian, how are Hi, you? Hi, thanks for having me here. Ah, oh, pleasure, pleasure, thanks for joining us. And uh, Ian is the author of Checkpoint Charlie, uh, which is published by Little Brown Book Group and uh, a fascinating subject and a fascinating book. As it's the wine down, Ian, I thought we'd start with, uh, with, with a bit of wine. Um, so I've picked out a German wine, unsurprisingly, <laughs> and I'm a massive fan of German wine. And this producer in particular, Von Bull, and they're based in Faltz, down in the sort of south, uh, in the southwest of Germany. Um, relative, relative newcomers to the wine world, 1849, um, but when the estate was founded, they took over a part of a far larger estate, um, Jordan Estate was known as, and then 20 odd years later, a Von Bull Riesling was served at the opening of the Suez Canal. Oh, wow. So, uh, okay. so a little bit of history oh. in the glass. So, cheers and thanks for joining us. Enjoy. Prost. Prost. So, how's the how's the the, uh, the festival been treating you? It's great. I, I was just saying to one of the organisers, we've just had our talk, and uh, I've done quite a few festival events last couple of months since mm. we come out of lockdown. Uh, I was in Scotland at the weekend at Wigtown, but this has been a great great festival that the questions were fantastic good audience uh sold out the books fantastic which is what you want but they, they genuinely uh really really like to talk and the nice thing was as well I, I found this with uh quite a few of the talks i've done a lot of the people that come to the talks because obviously you look out on the sea of people mm. uh where you hope to uh and uh they, they, they have connections to Berlin, whether as veterans that served in the Allied garrisons or whether they served in West Germany and went into Berlin itself. Uh, all the way back, I mean, the, I, I met John Le Carre's secretary at the weekend. Wow. It's a 92 year old. And uh, she just said, oh, we worked together in the 50s in the Berlin office. And I was like, wow. How fantastic. How, how amazing is that? So. I was, I was going to ask so, you what your favourite bit of a promotional tour was. Well, I think that would probably be it because yeah. I'm a big fan of his work anyway. Yeah. So to meet someone, and she, and she was just so, Full of life, and I thought, God, I hope I'm like that when I'm 92. But and such crystal clear memories as well. I mean, wow. we talked through. I mean, there was a holder for about seven or eight people behind her because I was thinking, I just want to carry on talking to you. How fascinating! So, Bless. Yeah. yeah. Great subject. Yeah. I mean, I was, you know, last week you. we got the shout you were joining us, which was like brilliant. And I started, and I mean, I did history in school and uh, university, and I've realised sort of meeting you today how much I, I need to check back into it because it is just fascinating. Well, most of my. Uh, because obviously in, in the lockdown, all the festivals were cancelled. Mainly they were all cancelled and mm. I had a lot lined up. So what I did over the last um, 14 months, uh, I, I've been giving Zoom lectures to schools and colleges. So that's primarily Good what on. I've been doing. And it's great because again, they, they do ask questions, but mm. uh, what I, like, I liked about the book was it's just packed full of oral history. So I've, I've interviewed yeah. nearly 80 people for the wow. book. Uh, Obviously, East and West Germans, East and West Berliners, Americans, French, uh, British, and obviously Soviets. So that's what I try and uh, express to the students that I'm talking to is oral history is the key thing you really need to get into. If you want to buy my book, great. If you don't, just get into the oral history and understand yeah. what people actually lived through yeah. during those times. That's much more important than just reading about the strategy, which is very dry. Sure. And, and the characters, yeah. we've already sort of yeah, touched on yeah, them, yeah. I mean, must be so rich and rewarding yeah. an experience. Yeah, well, it's, uh, in some ways it's a bit cliche too, so I'd meet, uh, I, I, so I just happened to be my job, I happened to be in New York anyway, so I met a lot of the Americans that are in the book in New York, some of them came as far as uh, North Carolina just to come up for the interview oh. in their 80s. Uh, they'd been around, they witnessed the ball going up as US military police or spies. Yeah. Uh, and that was great, and they're really full of life and uh, real, you know, as a historian you think this is just golden. Yes. It's fantastic, no one's spoken to them before. And then I'd interview, I'd set up, and it'd take months, I'd set up an interview with a, the Stasi commander who was in charge in the 70s of showing Soviet dignitaries around the Brandenburg Gate, because that's where the British sector enveloped the Brandenburg Gate, the East Germans had it, but we had our... Uh, uh, checkpoints right by it uh, and he was very much it was, it was like being in a Le Carre novel he was saying we're going to meet in this cafe I'm going to be sitting at this table do not bring a recorder I want to know what questions you want to uh, ask me beforehand fantastic it's very like that. wow, so, wow. Living, some, it. Some, living it yeah some things don't <laughs> change uh, so yeah it was fantastic wow there can't be many instances where I mean you know I guess with recent history but where a historian is actually sort of living 
and, and talking and breathing it. And you say, you know, meeting, meeting the former Stasi officers in a, in a cafe. Well, I mean, the, the most surreal one was uh, the, the commander of Checkpoint Charlie in 1989, the night the war opened, uh, uh, Peter Bochman, uh, Major Peter Bochman of the East German Border Guards. I went to his flat in northeast uh, Berlin, it's called Hohen Schoenhausen, and these amazing blocks of flats, uh, and they are quite state of the art, and, and, and they're paid for by the council, but it's almost like a retirement village for East German border guards. Right. And, uh, but when I walked into his room, it was like uh, the series Deutschland 84 and Deutschland 89, I'd literally walked back in time to the 70s wow. and by the wood panelling on the walls, the photos he had up, the way he was dressed, uh, just incredible. Mm. And, it, and he was very much a time served, uh, unrepentant, uh, fully bought into the East German ethic and gave me a two hour lecture on why everything he'd done was justified. So <clears throat> um, there was a really lovely article in The Guardian about, about your book, mm. uh, which was written by Neil Lasherson. Yes. And, um, I'm just going to start you off um, because I'd love to hear something about this chapter. Um, and it's the chapter involving Alan Leiter and his trip to the theatre yes. uh, with, his, with his wife. Yeah. Um, and it, it's, you, I think you said it, it basically nearly ignited Europe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, well, it's, uh, the chapter's called Who Blinks First? Right. And at that time, this is after the Berlin Wall's gone up. So it's a couple of months after this. Berlin Wall was August 13th. This happens on, I think it was October 22nd, if my memory serves me right. And Alan Leiter was a junior diplomat in the US consulate. And he was just taking his wife across Checkpoint Charlie into East Berlin, because that's where the theater district was. And you could live like a king. If, you got, if you're earning US currency or, or Western currency, you could live like a king on the ratio difference. It's three to one ratio difference. So a lot of the, the military and, and the diplomats there used to take their spouses into the theatre district, watch some amazing opera or a, a play, go to, for dinner in an amazing restaurant, uh, and you wouldn't even have to spend a week's wages. Mm. And that's what he was doing. But what was, unbeknownst to him, what was going on at higher levels were the East Germans and the Soviets had got away with building the wall, and now to try and ratchet up the tension on the Allies, they were thinking, right, we're going to stop them having their historically allowed rights of travel from the western sectors into the east. Uh, they hadn't stopped that when they were building the wall, which is one of the reasons why the Allies thought, we'll, we'll let that go. Uh, and kind of long story short, uh, one of the commanders on the ground for the Americans in Berlin that JFK, John F. Kennedy, had dropped in to be his eyes and ears, his guy that would keep him informed was an old Cold War warrior who'd been in charge of Berlin in 1947, a guy called General Lucius Clay. And again, to cut a long story short, he wasn't going to take a step backwards and within a few days had sent the tanks or all the Allied tanks that he had at his disposal, which wasn't many, it was probably about 20, to say, this has got to stop. Yeah. Uh, we, we want to have our rights of access. What he wasn't bargaining on was uh, the Soviet general, General Konev, uh, again, who was a Cold War warrior and was a, a famous general from the Second World War against the Nazis. Uh, he was going to send his tanks to the, the border as well. He wasn't going to be intimidated. And the problem was the, the Allied garrison only had about probably 40 tanks and armoured cars between them, whereas obviously they were surrounded by hundreds, if not thousands, of armoured troops and tanks uh, from the Soviet Red Army. So that's what ballooned. And before you know it, and this is before we have the internet and 24-hour yeah. news, and before they even had the, the hot phone between the Kremlin and the Washington, that only happened a couple of years later for the, after the Cuban Missile Crisis. So this is all going on on the ground, and it's the guys on the ground have to sort it out. And I won't spoil it for your viewers, you'll have to buy the yeah. book to find out what happens. But it was literally the only time in Cold War history, right up until the wall came down, that Russians and American troops were locked and loaded uh, with machine guns and tanks only a couple of hundred yards apart. Wow. And those are the, the most famous images, I guess, yeah, from that exactly. That, well, yeah, that is the famous image. Wow. So, Amazing. Yeah. Brilliant. Well... Ian, thank you so much for joining us for okay. Wind Down. It's been an absolute Thanks pleasure. I've really me. enjoyed your chat uh, with Giles earlier. Thank you. Um, but yeah, really looking forward to reading the book. Um, I'm hooked. So uh, Good. yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Cheers. All the best. Cheers. Cheers.